All right, Biology 11, our last lecture in the diversity unit is chordates, also known as some animals with some real spine. Um, not really afraid of these animals, right? These are the ones that you think, when you think of an animal, it's probably a chordate. Um, the only one I have a problem with, llamas, don't like them. I, I think they're a very distrustful animal. Um, the, the, the terrible hair, uh, bad teeth, uh, they spit at you, the crazy look in their eyes, like they, they don't care, like they'll do what they want. And I just, I can't be around an animal like that. Anyway, um, if you're a llama farmer, I apologize. And uh, yeah, well, not, you know what, no. Sorry, not sorry. Anyway, on with the show. So what is a chordate? A chordate is an animal that has a nerve cord that runs along their back. It's called the dorsal nerve cord. So dorsal nerve cord. Dorsal means along the back. Like the dorsal fin of a shark is like in, in those Jaws movies. It's that fin that pokes above the water. Well, that's the fin that comes out of the, you know, the, the shark's back. So a dorsal nerve cord means your nerve cord runs along your back. Ours does this. We're a chordate, right? So all chordates have gill slits near their throats at some point in their lives or their development. Now, for us, it's during our prenatal development. For things like fish and, well, the sharks I just mentioned, uh, they have them as adults, all right? So we don't have gills, that's not what I'm saying. Our gills, they dissolve during our development, they go away, but we do have them early on in embryonic development, so while we're in our mother's wombs. And all of us have a tail at some point, yes, just like the gills, I'm not saying we have a tail. We do have a tail bone that at one point was more elongated and then it fused together to form the coccyx that our tailbone. Um, but lots of chordates do have tails. Ours goes away during prenatal development again. And all chordates show bilateral symmetry. If you remember bilateral symmetry, that's where you could take an organism and cut it straight down the middle and have two equal halves. All right, so that was bilateral symmetry. Everybody in this group has that, all right? Now, something we have to differentiate between. There's chordates and there's vertebrates. And all vertebrates are chordates, but not all chordates are vertebrates. All right, seems kind of weird. So chordate is the larger group. This just means you have the dorsal nerve cord. I'll just put dorsal NC, dorsal nerve cord. Now, a vertebrate, has the vertebral column, it has the bones, right? Protecting its nerve cord, right? So this is like saying insects and beetles, all right? Insects is the larger group. There's a whole bunch of different insects. Beetles is one group within it. Same thing here, chordates is the larger group. Vertebrates is still a pretty big group, but it doesn't account for all of these, right? The same way you'd say, all beetles are insects, you can say all vertebrates are chordates, but you can't say all insects are beetles. So you can't say all of these are these, because there are some chordates that don't have a cartilage or a bony skeleton protecting their nerve cord. So we've got the vertebral column, our spinal column. It's all those bones that extend down from the back of our skull down to our tailbone, all right? So many, many chordates have that, but not all of them, all right? There's two early classes of chordates called the Eurochordata and Cephalochordata, right? These are very small creatures. Um, they don't have the bones or a cartilage skeleton protecting their dorsal nerve cord. They still have it running down their back, their dorsal side, but they don't have any real protection for it. The Eurochordata are, tun are tunicates, these are small marine creatures, marine meaning in the ocean. And then we have the cephalochordata, which are the lancelets. Uh, these are also small marine creatures. Um, so 
you probably haven't seen these things around. I don't think they're widely exposed a whole lot. But if you do go into, when I was doing marine ecology, we got these things all the time. They're not an uncommon thing in the ocean. But uh, again, they're, it's just two small little factions within this larger group. And because of the Eurocordata and Cephalocordata, we can't say that all of these are the same. So, um, and again, neither one of them had the bony vertebral column or even one made out of cartilage to protect their dorsal nerve cord. All right, so what is a vertebrate? A vertebrate has a backbone. It has those vertebrae that protect their dorsal nerve cord, all right? So other things that we're going to see in the vertebrates, a skull to protect their highly developed and large brains, well-developed internal cavities and organs. If we, man, if we can get back into this school at some point and get through this pandemic and get back into the doors of St. Mary, you'll, we do the dissection in grade 11, the pig dissection, and you see the internal cavities and, and just how neatly the organs are placed in there um, and, and that's you know well-developed internal cavities that house the organs I'd love to say we're gonna get back in there I'm not sure at this point but we'll see survival is a little bit more important um, they have a ventral heart um, so a ventral heart means that their heart has chambers and they have these highly muscleized or is it even muscleized the word anyway they have very muscular bottom sections of the heart called the ventricles muscleized Good one. Anyway, gas exchange is either done through gills, if you're an aquatic species, or lungs, if you're terrestrial, aquatic water, terrestrial land. And we're going to go through a whole bunch of different uh, uh, groups within the uh, vertebrates, and we've labeled them here. We'll go through them. So, agnatha is our first class. So, phylum chordata. And then our first class, if you remember our levels of classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So these are all classes. Class Agnatha. These are the jawless fish. There's not a whole lot of these, but there are some species still alive today, so we'll go over them quickly. Um, Agnathans are jawless fish. There's two main groups, the hagfish and the lampreys. Um, there's not very many species alive today. There's very few of them that are still around today. Um, they get outcompeted for by the by the fish that have jaws. So lampreys are ectoparasites. That means they're parasites. They live off the resources of another living thing. And ecto means they, they live on the outside, like a leech. A leech draws your blood, but it still lives on the outside of your body. That's what these lampreys do. And the hagfish is a scavenger. We know scavengers wait for someone else to kill something, any you know bones and, and meat that's left on the carcass, they'll go over and they'll, they'll eat from that. So there's a lamprey there. You can see there's its mouth. There's no jaw. There's no hinge there. So it just stays open like that 24-7. So there's one there, the ruler next to it. Just so you can see, like, these are not small little things. You'd notice that if that was swimming by you. Here's a game warden, and it's showing some fish that had an issue with lampreys. And the lampreys, you can see the, the huge wounds on the side of the fish where the lamprey was stuck to it. Here's a hagfish, again a scavenger, so it kind of just lurks around and hides off in the corners and crevices and that. And then if something like a shark or a barracuda happens to take something down, there'd be little bits of food that would float away from that carcass that this thing could feed on. And there's what its mouth looks like, and it doesn't, again, it doesn't close. It doesn't have that hinge that we have or that other vertebrates have. And there's some guy that's just put a lamprey on his head. I, I don't know why you'd do that, but I guess it made for a good photo. Anyway, chondrichthys is our next class. Chondrichthys are your cartilaginous fish. You 
Now, this ichthys right here, when you see that, that means fish. All right. Um, <clears throat> we're going to see this in another class within the um, chordates. But what we're also, where you also may have seen this is an ichthyosaur. An ichthyosaur was one of the few aquatic dinosaurs that swam along and had fins, not legs. So an ichthyosaur really meant a, a, a fish dinosaur, really. The chondra part here means cartilaginous. Chondrocytes in your body are what make cartilage. So chondrocyte is basically a cartilage-making cell. Site is cell. So chondrocytes is uh, where you may have seen that before. And that just basically means cartilage. So cartilage, uh, if you want to feel cartilage, just feel the end of your nose, your earlobes, right? So the end of your nose, that's cartilage. Your earlobes are cartilage. Um, that's what their skeleton is made out of. So sharks and skates and rays, which belong to this group, they have a softer sort of skeleton. Um, sharks, skates, and rays. So when things develop and they start to grow a skeleton, including ourselves and dogs and, and birds and you know reptiles, the skeleton starts off as cartilage and then it undergoes a process of ossification. Ossification is where the bone cells take over and you get that hard, you know, like rock-like bones, like what we have, our bones are hard, right? Same with your dog, same with the lizard, same with the frog, same with the bird. But these things, that cartilage skeleton develops and it never undergoes that process of ossification, all right? So that's the difference. So there's still a skeleton there, there's still a you know vertebral column protecting that dorsal nerve cord, it's just made out of a softer material. They have two sets of paired fins, pectoral fins. Pectoral means coming out of the chest area. You think of your pecs, if you go to the gym and work out your pecs, it's, it's chest day. And pelvic fins, your pelvis is where your legs meet up with the rest of your body. So that's down lower and I have some pictures that will show that. And breathing is done as water moves over gills. They can't ever stop. So sharks can't stop swimming, uh, rays can't stop swimming, they have to at least be moving at some point. And, and when sharks, I guess, you know, I'll put air quotes around it, when they sleep, they go into a trance-like state, but they still have to continue moving. Because if water stops going over their gills, they stop getting the infusion of oxygen into their blood. And that will mean death, because you need oxygen to make energy. Sharks are ovoviviparous. So here's a word. I'll see if I can get it in here. Ovo viviparous. Ovo is egg and vivi is life. Alright, so eggs are fertilized internally inside of the female. So she has eggs, they get fertilized, and inside of her the eggs will hatch. So it looks like she's giving birth to live young. Same way a human would or your cat would or whatever, right? But the eggs that are in there do have a shell. It's a soft shell. And usually what, usually what happens is the first shark or two that hatches eats their siblings. So you want to be the first one out of the egg. If you're in a, in a, a clutch of eggs that's, that's inside of a mother shark, you want to be the first one out. Um, that's how they gain their first nutrition and then they are given birth to. So it looks like they're given birth to live young, but they start in eggs at first. So we look at some here. Here is a great white shark. Here you can see the dorsal fin here. Here are your pectoral fins, those larger ones on the side. The pelvic fins you can kind of see in this one down here. And of course you have your tail here. If something gray and streamlined like this is swimming at you in the ocean, the way to tell this apart from you know, a shark that's going to eat you and the dolphin that's going to help you out is the tail. You can see the tail. They both have the dorsal fin, but the tail. On a dolphin, the tail goes side to side. It goes east to west. On a shark, it goes north to south, the tail fin. There's a, another great white, and you can see a very 
brave guy, much braver than I, in that cage. <coughs> Here's one here, you can see again, there's our pectoral fins and the pelvic fins are down here. You can actually enlarge that picture on your own slideshow. There's another one here, you can see this shark has breached the water going after prey. And you can see here, pelvic fins and pectoral fins here. You can see the gills here as well. Here is a ray, again, these very large extensions off to the side are the pectoral fins, and you can see the two smaller ones down here where the tail meets the body, those are the pelvic fins. And there you can see it there again. All right, and again there, so. The next one is class osteichthys. So if I look at that word again, I can see the ichthys at the end of it. So osteichthys. Now, ichthys we know is fish, and osteo is bone. So these are bony fish. An osteocyte is what makes, it's, it's a bone cell. It's what makes up your skeleton inside of your body. So osteo means bone, ichthys is fish. So these are the bony fish. These are like your tuna and your bass and sturgeon and all those other things. A lot of the fish you go out and catch. Um, so the internal skeleton starts as cartilage, but it gets replaced with bone. It undergoes ossification. They have a flat, smooth, lightweight scales that cover over their body. Uh, the sharks kind of have like a toughened skin. They don't have the scales like these fish do. They use gills to breathe, but what they have that the sharks don't have is a thing called an operculum. And the operculum, right, if someone ever does a fish face and they take their hands and they put them by their ears and they do this sort of thing when they're the fish. And they're going like this. All right, someone does the fish face like that, and they've got their hands doing that at the sides of their head. What that is, that's the operculum. It's a little plate that goes over their gills, and it moves back and forth. And what it does is it fans or pumps water over the gills. So they don't have to continuously move. So if this thing has to you know, hide from a, from a larger predator like a shark, it can go into a little nook or crevice, and it can stay there. It can stop swimming and just remain motionless and wait for the danger to pass. A shark could never do that. So this little operculum helps these things breathe even when they're not moving. Uh, most bony fish also have swim bladders. And the swim bladder is something that they can fill up full of water and it helps them remain buoyant at different levels within the water, right? It's kind of like a weight belt that a scuba diver may have. It helps them maintain their position within the water. Without it, they might float to the surface. Right? The lungfish actually uses its swim bladder as a modified lung. It fills it full of air. But it's the only one that can do that. Most fish use it for swimming purposes. And what they do is, and, 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 and I'm sorry, but I've, I've got to do it. It's my scientific duty. Um, I'm going to destroy some Disney movies as we go through this course. Finding Nemo. Right? If you remember Finding Nemo, the clownfish, you got the, the little clownfish there, Nemo and his dad, and his dad's like, oh, Nemo, I care for you so much. I care. Oh, let's go find, well, I can't even remember what they were going to go find. But anyway, the dad really cared. Oh, they were finding Nemo. They had to find him. What, what, where's my head at? The whole movie was called Finding Nemo. That makes sense. All right, so Nemo gets lost, and the dad's like, oh, we got to go find him. We got to go find my son. That's a lie. That's a Disney lie. They do not care. Fish do not care about their children. All right? So Disney lied to you there. Sorry um, if your heart's broken. There's not much I can do about that. But what happens is the females deposit their eggs on the floor of the, well, on, on the ocean floor, the lake bed, right? Depending if they're freshwater or, or marine. And then the males come along and just spray their sperm in the general area. So they can sense that, oh, there's the same species as me has laid some eggs here. They go and they spray their sperm there. There's no fish sex or nothing like that. Female lays the eggs, swims away. Male sprays the sperm, swims away. Little fish never know who their parents are. I know that's a much sadder movie and that's why Disney lied to you and said, oh, look, the fish parents care. But 
That's the way it is, right? Fish hatchlings never know their real parents. Finding Nemo is a lie. Anyway, Osseectes. So here's a tuna. Now, this picture doesn't show you how big a tuna can get, but I've seen tuna caught down in Nova Scotia. And these things can be several hundred pounds. I've seen one bluefin tuna fill up the back bed of a, of a pickup truck. You know, 800, 900 pounds, some of these things. And what they do is when they take the tuna to the shore, so you catch it, you take the tuna to the shore, they take a little core out of the tuna. And there's a guy there on the shore right outside of the fish plant, and he tells you the grade of the meat. And then they weigh the fish, and you get paid by that grade. So if you have a really good grade fish, and I'm, I'm going to make the prices up because I don't know them. I've only seen it kind of go on. I don't know what the, the going rate of tuna meat is. But let's say you have a great fish. The quality of the meat is awesome. You might get 5 bucks a pound. If your fish is a little less awesome, you might get $3.50 a pound. So that's kind of what they do here. But I've seen guys come in off the boats growing up in Cape Breton. And that they've, they come in with fish that are like 800, 900 pounds I've seen a couple that probably are topping a thousand. And these things just fill up the back bed of a truck. They're monstrous. They have a crane right on the dock to get those ones off the boats. There is a barracuda. It's a marine predator. It has very sharp teeth. Also the topic of a wicked song from Hart. Google it. Put on Spotify. You'll see. Sculpins. Sculpins. Um, these are fish that... When we fish off docks and that back in Cape Breton, we try to get good fish that you could eat. And every so often you'd hook one of these bad boys and, and they're just useless. They can't do anything. So we would always try to throw them back in, but we'd always say some cool movie line and then whip them back into the water. We weren't very nice, I guess, but sculpins, I thought I'd throw those in here. Childhood memory. And there's a swordfish. Um, we have these off of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. People go out there and they catch marlin or sword. Sorry, I think probably swordfish, not marlin. They're related, I think. But that's that. Our next class is amphibia. The amphibians. So the amphibians are an important step in our evolution because what they do is they represent the bridge of all life being aquatic to a good deal of life becoming terrestrial. So this is how we, biologists believe that this is how we made the, the move from becoming a land-based species or having land-based life forms from, well, what used to be all aquatic life forms. So they do still need water. If you're an amphibian, you still need water. In fact, a part of your life cycle, if you think of a frog that's an amphibian, part of its life cycle, the tadpole, swims in the water. It lives in the water exclusively. It has gills, right? And then it goes through metamorphosis and becomes a frog and can then be terrestrial and live on the land. So they start with gills. They develop lungs later on. The frog has a three-chambered heart. Air. How do they breathe? Well, they do have lungs, so they can breathe like we do and get oxygen into its body and make energy from it. But they can also breathe through their skin, some of these species. Their skin is very, very thin, and diffusion can take place right across the surface of the skin. So it'd be like you closing off your nose and mouth, and you, you wouldn't die. You could breathe through your skin. Um, amphibians reproduce very similarly to fish. Um, the mother lays the eggs, or the eggs will come out of the female of the species. The male sprays a the sperm. There is no act of sex or anything like that. And then they bugger off, and little froglings never know who their frog parents are. So another example of very poor parenting. But usually what nature does to combat this, if you're, if you're not a very good parent, you get tons and tons and tons of offspring, and Mother Nature goes, well, some of them will get through. If you only have a few offspring like humans or bears or, or other animals, elephants and that, you often invest a lot of your energy as a parent. There's a lot more energy in the parenting, all right? Common amphibians include frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts, all right? So if we look here, there's a poison dart frog. So when we see something like this in nature, and we've mentioned it before in the invertebrates, look at the bright colors on that frog. That frog out of its back has cells that exude a neurotoxin. 
And in fact, indigenous hunters, what they'll do is they'll take the tips of their arrows and they'll rub them on the back of the frog. And then when they go hunting, when the arrow pierces whatever it is that they're hunting, that neurotoxin breaks down the brain's control of the muscles and the thing basically stops moving. And then they can eat it. There is a leopard frog. These are the types of frogs you probably dissected in grade 10. And there is a salamander there. We have sat lots of salamanders around. If you go hunting and looking around for them, you'll find them. And there's a toad. Toad has a little bit rougher surface of this to the skin. Uh, they used to say if you, you, you handle toads, you got warts because they look like have, they have covered in warts. That's, that's not true. You can hang out with toads, you won't get warts. And here's a tadpole that's right in the middle of metamorphosis. So you can still see the tail section here, but you can see the legs developing and then there's a few more poison dart frogs. Our next class are the reptiles. I feel like I don't have to write down what they are because I feel you probably know what these things are. Like I said, when we think of animals, this is what we think of, right? Things like frogs, things like sharks and fish and, and reptiles. So reptiles, alligators, crocodiles, turtles, lizards, snakes, all of those things, they're all reptiles. Uh, reptiles kind of picked up where amphibians left off in terms of coming out of the water and onto the land. They have a terrestrial lifestyle. Only theirs can be, some um, reptiles are exclusively terrestrial. They don't, they don't breed in the water. They don't need the water to, to, you know, to house their young or anything like that. So they've really become uh, specific to a terrestrial lifestyle. They don't need water to reproduce. They can live fine just on land. They don't have like a tadpole stage. They have eggs that have a hard shell. Amphibians have a soft shell egg. These have a hard shell. And so it minimizes water loss around the young. Fertilization is internal. So that means there is a, 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 a sex act here. They have to actually uh, inseminate the female. And then eggs, fertilized eggs are laid and then they're looked after by, by the parents. Tough scaly skin uh, restricts water loss. They don't have that thin skin that allows for diffusion like the uh, amphibians do. They have tough scaly skin. And they have kidneys that can form really highly concentrated urine. So your kidneys look after your water balance. So if it's you're, you haven't had a whole lot of water, um, for an amphibian that could be deadly, but for a reptile their kidneys just concentrate their urine and allow more water to be kept in the body. And the lungs of a reptile are considerably larger to an amphibian because again, you don't have the help of oxygen diffusing through the skin. Their skin is too thick and too tough. So if we look at some reptiles here, I don't know what this man is doing, but it's wrong. Um, you just look at him there. You know, who wants to go pet the 15 foot crocodile? This guy raised his hand. Um, I don't know if he's still alive, I would doubt it. I mean, he's playing with danger here. Anyway, braver than me. There's another picture. You can see the, the tough scaly surface of the of the crocodile there. A tortoise. Here's a snake. Now this is one of these snakes. One of them is safe and one of them is dangerous. And I think if it's red next to yellow, deadly fellow. Red next to black, friend of Jack. So if you look at the bands, the red here is next to the yellow. So this is the deadly fellow. This is the one that if it bites you, you're probably going to die. There's another snake that mimics this one because no one wants to go near the snake. Again, notice the bright colors. But the red is next to the black, not the yellow. So red next to black, friend of Jack. Red next to yellow, deadly fellow. So this is the deadly one. And there's a sea snake. A sea snake, um, some sea snakes... Some sea snake species, tongue twister, um, have some of the deadliest toxins on the planet of all the animals. Sea snakes have some really deadly toxins. Our next group is avies. And avies are the birds, right? Because they are aviators. They fly. That's where avies comes from. It means flight. 
All right. So we look here. The avians are the birds. All right. They have they develop from reptiles. We all learned that in Jurassic Park, or maybe your parents did. Uh, I remember in the original Jurassic Park, that was the big speech at the beginning. Birds came from reptiles. Anyway, they have scales on their legs. Reptiles had scales. They have large yoked eggs in a firm shell. Reptiles have that. There's no metamorphosis in the young. The metamorphosis is like the tadpole, which kind of looked like a sperm cell, becoming a frog. Reptiles don't have that. Well, neither do birds. So that means when a reptile or a bird hatches out of its egg, it's a little version of itself, of the adult. So out of an egg for a fish, you get a tadpole. Or sorry, <clears throat> totally wrong. Out of an egg for an amphibian, you get a tadpole. That doesn't look like a frog. We know it will become a frog, but it has to go through metamorphosis first. Birds and reptiles, when their egg hatch, so if you have a crocodile, what hatches out of the egg is a little crocodile that looks like it. When you have a bird, a chicken, what hatches is a chick. It looks like a little chicken. So there's no metamorphosis in the young. Birds differ though from these previous groups, from the reptiles, because they are endotherms. Endotherms. Endo means inside or inner. And therm is heat, which means they have an internal body temperature that they maintain. Ours is 37 degrees Celsius. So our body works and expends energy to maintain that 37 degrees Celsius because that's what our cells work optimally in is that temperature of 37 degrees. That's hotter than it is outside more often than not. So we do have to put energy towards that. Birds are the same way. They have to maintain an internal body temperature and keep it there. All the other things so far, the fish and the reptiles, the amphibians, they're ectotherms. Ectotherms are cold-blooded. They're not warm-blooded like the birds and us are. They're cold-blooded. And basically how they warm up is they have to go out and lay out in the sunlight or go lay somewhere where it's warm. Right, to warm up their bodies and get their metabolism going. We don't have to worry about that, neither do the birds. They're endothermic, so are we. They also have feathers, which evolved from scales. And of course, the feathers are one of the things that allow them to preserve heat, because there's layers of feathers, just like layers of clothes will help you preserve heat. And they allow for flight. Hollow bones. The bones are still hard. They still undergo ossification, so they're still made of osteocytes, they're hard, but they're hollow. This lightens the bird up so it can fly. And then of course they have air sacs that branch off of their throat area, right? The trachea, the wind tube. And what this does, it helps them with buoyancy. Water is a fluid, but so is air, right? Air is a fluid as well. So to keep them buoyant and, and balanced within the air, they have air sacs that they, can, that they can partially inflate and that helps the bird with its buoyancy within the air. If you look at some avians here, uh, this is a bald eagle. We have these uh, in, in Cape Breton. They're big, big birds. Uh, there's a bald eagle nest up behind my place, and I bet you the nest was probably at least two and a half to three meters in diameter. That's through the middle of the nest. It was a huge nest. The birds are very, very big. There's an ostrich there with baby ostriches. There's a penguin. A hummingbird. Hummingbirds need to eat a ton of calories a day because their metabolism is just so highly ramped up. And Senor Toucan. I remember my kids used to watch Dora the Explorer and this guy. I didn't trust him. He was the only character that didn't have like the soft childlike voice. It was like everyone else spoke like a baby almost and then this guy would come along with his dark deep accent and I just didn't trust him. I thought he was always going to lead Dora astray. Anyway, the mammals. Class mammalia. This is us. So class mammalia has mammary glands. 
and mammary glands are what produce milk to feed the young. All right? So the females do that for us. Well, the females do it for pretty much everyone here. Um, other key traits of mammals, they're endothermic. Again, just like the birds, we just discussed that. They maintain an inner temperature that's higher than the environment more often than not. They're covered in hair or fur, and we have a four-chambered heart. So we look here. There's a lion, a very large mammal. Here's a kangaroo. Now, there's different types of mammals. A lion is a placental mammal, just like we are. There's a placenta inside with the children as they're developing inside of the mother. And the placenta helps nourish them and do all that sort of stuff. Here, the kangaroo, it gives, um, it gives birth to premature young. So when the lion cubs are born, they live outside of the parent's body and they're good to go. I mean, they got to be looked after and taught, but they're, they 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 don't have to be protected as much. They can, you know, walk around after a little bit, and they live outside of the parent's body. The kangaroos and that these are marsupial mammals, and what they do is they give birth to the young while they're still really premature. So when the young kangaroo comes out of the mother's body, it's not ready to live outside of the mother's body yet. So it goes into a pouch, and the mammary glands are in that pouch. And the rest of the development before it can live freely outside of the parent occurs inside of that pouch. And that's a common trait to all the marsupials. And there's a duck-billed platypus. This is our third main category of mammals. These are monotreme mammals. This is one of the few types of mammals that lay eggs. Right? No eggs here, no eggs here. These things lay eggs. And I mean eggs with a shell, right? There's a silver back at the zoo, a large gorilla. There's a cat and a dog. There's a nice friendly possum. Actually, possums can be quite friendly. We met one at the Oshawa Generals game and my daughter got to, to pet it. It seemed like a really, it almost seemed like a really nice little dog in a way. This one doesn't seem as nice. He might have rabies. And then of course, Kung Fu Chimp, the ultimate mammal. Anyway, that's it. And uh, do you know what grinds Peter Griffin's gears? Six foot tall chickens with attitudes. If you've ever watched The Family Guy, every so often Peter and this chicken, they just have this epic like three, four, five minute fight that takes up a good chunk of the episode, but it's, it is a, it's a wicked battle. Anyway, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. If you have any comments, you can comment below the uh, video here in the comments section or go to Edsby and you can ask questions there. Hope you enjoyed the lecture and learned something. Um, we'll talk again soon. All right, bye-bye.